Now we want to review what we've studied so far before we get into the angel's oath. Uh, Revelation chapter 11 uh, begins with a mighty angel that descends from heaven. Who is that mighty angel? That mighty angel is Jesus Christ. And we know that by the description that is given of this mighty angel in verse chapter 1. Now this angel, this mighty angel, Jesus Christ, has probably in his left hand, because he swears with his right hand, in his left hand he has what? A little book. And this little book is what portion of Daniel? Daniel 8 through 12, particularly what aspect of Daniel 8 through 12? The aspect that has to do with the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. We've already noticed that the sequence of events that lead to that moment could be understood before the time of the end. But it's primarily the sequence of events that leads to that point that is sealed. That point is sealed until the time of the end. So basically it's the portion of Daniel that has to do with the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment on October 22, 1844. So this angel descends with this open book and when does he descend? What date does the angel descend? At the beginning of the time of the end. When is the time of the end? When does that begin? It begins in 1798. So Revelation chapter 10, the beginning point of this chapter is 1798. The beginning of the time of the end. And so the angel descends from heaven. He has this little book that is going to impart a message. And then he places his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. What does that represent? That this is going to be a global message. This is going to be a worldwide message. Is it necessary to have a worldwide church to have a worldwide message? That's the reason for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to proclaim the message of Revelation 10. So then Jesus plants his feet on the sea and on the land and by this he's saying that this message from the little book the judgment hour message has to be what kind of a message? Has to be a global message. What does the act of planting the feet mean? It means that the angel Jesus Christ is saying this world is mine and I will soon take it over and when the seventh trumpet sounds he actually takes it over we're going to notice. Now after the angel has descended with the open book which means a message, a judgment hour message is going to come from the book after he's planted his feet saying this world is mine, this message is going to be global then he utters a loud voice like a what? Lion. Like a lion's roar. And when he lets out the lion's roar, what comes forth? Seven thunders come forth. Now, um, did John understand what the seven thunders uttered? Yes, because we are told that he was about to what? To write what the thunders uttered. So he must have understood in order to be able to write it. But when he's about to write what the thunders uttered, he was instructed by this mighty angel, don't write down what you've heard. Seal it. Because it's not best for the people who lived during this period to know the things that were uttered by the seven thunders. Now, what was uttered by the seven thunders? We read a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy yesterday. What, what was this issue of the seven thunders? What was, re, what was revealed to John which he did not record because it was not best for the people to know these things? Okay, remember that they first believed, William Miller first believed that Jesus was going to come what, what date? About the year 1843. William Miller never set a date. He said about the year 1843. Was he right? No, he was wrong both with regards to the event and he was wrong with regards to the time. What happened after 
1843 passed. How did the people react to this? Oh, they were deeply disappointed, right? And that was a bad thing. Was that a bad thing? No. Why did God allow them to go through this? Could God have revealed the mistake that they made? Of course. Why didn't he? Because we noticed that their faith needed to be tested and it needed to be revealed who truly longed for the coming of Jesus and who was along only for the ride or because of fear. Right? So did the seven thunders utter that there was going to be this disappointment? Yes. Was it best for people to know that? No. No. So God said, seal it. Then they expected Jesus to come when? In the spring of 1844. They're getting closer, right? Were they still wrong about the event? Were they still wrong about the time? Yes, they were wrong about the time. Jesus was, the the 2200 days was not fulfilled in the spring of 1844. That's right. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> We're talking about the spring in New England. <laughs> you should know better. New England. <laughs> okay, from the perspective of the eastern portion of the United States, Jesus was not going to come in the spring of 1844. Thanks very much for making me make the correction. When was Jesus, when was the prophecy going to be fulfilled? It was going to be fulfilled in the fall. So when the spring passed, what happened with everybody? Again, they were what? Disappointed. Disappointed. Said Jesus didn't come. Where did we go wrong? And then early summer, 1844, a man by the name of Samuel Snow started studying the feasts. And he said, now wait a minute. The Day of Atonement was not in the spring. The Day of Atonement was in the fall. So it must be that Jesus is going to come not in the spring. We were wrong about the timing, but he's going to come in the fall. In the fall in the eastern United States. And, uh, and so now you have the midnight cry. You have a great revival. The five wise virgins that slumbered suddenly wake up. And they say, the bridegroom cometh. Prepare to meet him. They still didn't understand that the coming of the bridegroom was not to come here. It was to go in heaven to the Father for the marriage. See, for Jesus to to, uh, partake of the marriage is the same as him taking over the kingdom. Two different symbols. The symbol of marriage and the symbol of a king. So to receive the kingdom is the same as to marry his kingdom. Are you with me or not? And so... And so uh, there was this great awakening. Was it best for them to know that Jesus was not going to come in the spring of 1844? Was it best? Of course it was best. Why was it best for them to, uh, not to know that Jesus was not going to come in the spring of 1844? Because once again, their faith needed to be what? Tested. It needed to be revealed who was along for the ride who was there for fear and not because they really loved the coming of Jesus. So, was the the message that there was going to be a disappointment in the spring of 1844, was that revealed to John? Yes. Yes. But what was he told? Seal it. Because it's not best for people to know this. We read statements from Ellen White that shows that this is true. And by the way, folks, what's happening in, in this movement, this Advent movement, It's not that about 50 years later, they're reading all of this back into Revelation chapter 10. No, this is happening, and then later on, after it happens, they say, oh wow, this is Revelation 10. Are you with me? So they're not simply inventing this after the fact to say, see, all of these events were fulfilled in Revelation 10. No, they're actually fulfilling the prophecy, and then later on they say, wow, our movement fulfilled this particular chapter of the Bible. So the seven thunders uttered their voices. There, it was a delineation of events, Ellen White says, very clearly. And it was not best for people to know this because their faith needed to be tested. 
And so this angel, this, these are primarily things that are happening between 1842 and 1844. Although William Miller in 1831 had already said that Jesus was going to come about the year 1843. But this intensified between 1842 and 1844. There, there was a, a tremendous revival and enthusiasm as you neared the date that William Miller had predicted that Jesus would come in general terms about the year 1843. Now, the angel that utters, uh, that, that utters this uh, sound of a thunder, uh, the, the, this voice that sounds like thunder, and uh, now he raises his right hand to heaven, and he swears an oath. This is after the seven thunders, right? Are you seeing the, the sequence here? Revelation 10 begins in what date? 1798. Then we've moved to events that take place primarily between 1842 and the spring of 1844. And now we're going to move a little bit further forward to the time when the angel actually raises his right hand and he swears an oath. And this is what we want to take a look at now. So let's go to the screen. You have it there. After the angel descended from heaven with the open book, what date is that? 1798. And the seven thunders had uttered their message. What, uh, what years was that? Primarily 1842 to 1844, when they went through the first two disappointments, because they, they, it was not best for them to know these things, because their faith needed to be tested. The angel then raises his right hand to heaven, and swears an oath in the name of the eternal God, the Creator, that time would be no longer. So what I want you to have in mind now is that the angel raises his hand, probably his right hand because he has the little book in his left hand, and he swears the oath that time will be no longer. Now the question is, when is this taking place? To what time was this, um, was this oath of the angel be re referring to? Was it uh, the close of probation? Was it uh, the second coming of Jesus? No. It referred to the closing of the time period of the 2,300 days. It referred to the time element of Daniel 8 through 12. Isn't that the central theme of the book? Absolutely. What the angel is saying is that prophetic time will no longer be a factor. There will be no more prophetic time. Let me read you two statements from Ellen White where she makes this explicitly clear. Then I'll prove to you that Ellen White was correct. The first statement says, This time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history. So it's not saying time comes to an end. No. Neither of probationary time, but of what? Prophetic, Prophetic time which should precede the advent of our Lord. Notice, this time that comes to an end, an end is before the coming of the Lord. She continues explaining, that is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from when to when? From 1842 to 1844. See, there you have that period of the seven thunders. There can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to when? To the autumn of 1844. Autumn in New England. <laughs> now here comes another statement. And the angel which I saw, she first of all quotes the verse in uh, Revelation 10, 5 and 6. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are th therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. And then she explains, this message announces the end of the prophetic periods. What are the prophetic periods? Would the 1260 days be a prophetic period? Yes. Would the time, times, and dividing of time be a prophetic period? Uh, would uh, 
the three and a half days of the French Revolution be one of those prophetic time periods? Uh, would the 2300 days be one of those prophetic periods? Yes. What she's saying is this message announces the end of the prophetic periods. The disappointment of those who expected to see our Lord in 1844 was indeed what? Bitter to those who had so ardently looked for His appearing. And now notice, it was in the Lord's order that this disappointment should come and that hearts should be revealed. So was the disappointment in 1844, October 22, also intended by God? Yes. Absolutely. So there were three of them. 18, about the year 1843, the spring of 1844, and October 22, 1844. Now how do we know that Ellen White is right in saying that the, the time will be no longer does not refer to the end of the world, neither to the close of probation. How do we know that she's right? Two reasons. Reason number one, you have it there on the screen. The announcement that time would be no longer was made by the angel during the period of which trumpet? During the period of the sixth trumpet. But let me ask you, when does the mystery of God finish and when does Jesus take over the kingdoms of the world? The mystery of God finishes shortly before the seventh trumpet blows and then Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world uh, at the time of the seventh trumpet. So when does Jesus come to take over the kingdoms of the world? During the seventh trumpet. But this is happening during which trumpet? The sixth trumpet. So must it be happening before the second coming and before the close of probation? Yes. Absolutely. Because it's happening under number six, not number seven. Secondly, uh, well let me read you this statement first from Revelation 11, 15 to 17. This is the seventh trumpet. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Notice, they have become. So during the seventh trumpet, does Jesus take over the kingdoms of the world? Yes. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. So when does Jesus take over the kingdoms? At the seventh trumpet. But when does the angel declare that time will be no longer? Under the sixth trumpet. So can that refer to the end of the world? No. no. Can it refer to the close of probation? It can't refer to the close of probation either. Reason number two, and this is very significant. Here we can know that it's not the close of probation either. You say, why? Because after the angel, the mighty angel says, time will be no longer. He tells John to eat the book. It's sweet in the mouth. It's bitter in the stomach. And then John is told to do what? Prophesy. To prophesy again. Let me ask you, what good would it do to prophesy again if probation is closed? Are you understanding the argument? Yes. So time no longer cannot refer to the close of probation because during the sixth trumpet, John eats the book, it's sweet and then bitter, and then he's told to prophesy again. If probation had closed, he would never be told to prophesy again. It wouldn't do any good. Are you following me or not? Yes. And also, reason number one that we notice, uh, very important, is the fact that this happens during the sixth trumpet and Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world during the period of what? Of the seventh trumpet. Now, unfortunately, all modern versions of the Bible, including the Andrews University Study Bible, translate the expression, time will be no longer, as there should no longer be any delay. What this does is it disconnects the comment that time will be no longer with the time of the 2300 days in Daniel chapter 8. Because delay is different than time will be no longer. Now is this a correct translation that there will no longer be any delay? 
Absolutely not. Look at the next paragraph. In the book of Revelation, the word chronos, which is the word time, we get the word chronology from that, is used three other times in Revelation. None of the modern versions translate it delay in, the, in those references. One of them is Revelation 2.21 where it says that God gave Jezebel time to repent. The other is in, da- in Revelation 6 verse 11 where it says that the martyrs are crying out uh, for them to be judged and avenged and they're told to rest still a little time or a little while. And the third reference is Revelation 20 verse 3 where it says that uh, the dragon will be released after the millennium for a little time or a little while. In other words, all the other references in Revelation of the word chronos, they don't translate it delay, they translate it time. Who do you suppose wants this text to be mistranslated? It's the devil, because he doesn't want people to connect Daniel 8.14 with Revelation chapter 10 because it identifies the remnant movement. It identifies the true church, in other words. Another interesting detail. The word chronos, time, in over 30 other places in the New Testament, is translated time, never delay. So you might think that the translators have an agenda. Furthermore, there is a Greek word for delay. The word chronizo. It's used, for example, in Matthew 24, 48, where the servant says, my master delays his coming. So if John had wanted to speak about a delay, he would have used chronizo. But he didn't. He used chronos. Prophetic time would be no longer. Now let me ask you. Would the oath of the angel that time would be no longer be given after all of the prophetic periods had been fulfilled? When the angel says time will be no longer, referring to prophetic time, must all of the other time prophecies have been fulfilled by that point? Yes, Yes, because then he couldn't say that time will be no longer. Yet there are Adventist, Adventist expositors that are playing games with the prophetic periods. They say, well, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, those are still future. There is no more setting of prophetic time. There are no more events that are marked by time. So if somebody comes telling you, you know, that uh, that certain event is going to happen at a certain date, you can know that that person is misguided. You know, there was one individual who, who even took the story of, uh, of Egypt, the seven years of, of plenty and the seven years of famine. He said the seven years of plenty uh, began 2001 through 2008. And then in 2008, you had this terrible economic downturn. And th- he said this right after 2008, by the way. He said the seven years of famine are 2008 to 2015. And in the United States... Uh, martial law is going to be proclaimed and the government is going to confiscate everybody's property and people are going to have to live off the government. Well, here we are in 2017 and it hasn't happened. So that person is a false prophet. Are you with me or not? Don't believe anybody who's setting specific dates or time for the fulfillment of prophetic events. There is no more, there are no more time prophecies after 1844. So, the 42 months have been fulfilled by this time, 1260 days, the three and a half times, uh, time times the dividing of time, the three and a half years of the, or days of the French Revolution, and the 2300 day prophecy have all been fulfilled when the angel proclaims the oath that time will be no longer. Now, You'll find that non-Adventists accuse Adventists of being time-setters. There was, oh, you're the church that said Jesus was going to come back October 22, 1844, and Jesus didn't come. You're the time-setting church. Well, surprise, surprise, the Seventh-day Adventist church has never set a time for any prophetic event. Because in 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist church didn't exist. 
It was a multi-denominational, multi-national movement. There were individuals who became Adventists later from the movement, the aftermath of 1844. But 1844 was not set by the Seventh-day Adventist Church as the date for the coming of Jesus. Rather, the Seventh-day Adventist Church corrected the misconception. Are you with me? Let me read a couple of statements from Ellen White. Review and Herald, July 21, 1851. This is very early. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord and that it should not be hung on time. You know there are some people that are saying that Jesus is going to come before the year 2031 because they try to figure out how long Adam lived before he sinned. That is not our message. Oh my sons, don't hang the third angel's message on time is what she's saying. She says, for time never will be a test again. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time. Because let's face it, when you, when you set a date, people get excited. Do you know, there's an individual who, who, who has been corresponding me by email and by a very convoluted method of calculating the different time periods in the Bible, he, he has said, Pastor Bohr, Donald Trump will never be inaugurated as President of the United States. Obama is going to have a third term. Well, tomorrow's the day. Or is it today? See? Tomorrow's the day, right? No, no. Today's the day. It's Thursday, right? In the United States. It's Friday here. It's Thursday there. So the inauguration is today. New, according to New Zealand time. So, so if Trump is inaugurated, what happened with all of his convoluted method of calculating the prophetic time periods? He's proved to be a false prophet. But I'm sure many people got excited. You remember Harold Camping? Jesus was going to come in 2012 and he even set a specific date. And there were people that were selling their stuff and there were people that were, that were moving out into the country and they were sending all their money to family radio because uh, family radio needed to share the message with the world. And Jesus didn't come in 2012. People just don't learn. And Adventists don't learn. That's a sad thing. Ellen White, these are only two statements from Ellen White. There are multiple statements where Ellen White says, don't set dates for prophetic events. Yet some people are saying, well, the 1290 reveal when the National Sunday Law will be, the 1335 reveal when the, the international uh, or worldwide uh, Sunday Law is going to be proclaimed. No, 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 no. Don't go there. She continues saying, I saw that some were getting a false excitement arous arising from preaching time. That the third angel's message was stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and that it needs not time to strengthen it and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. Does the third angel's message need us to attach time to it? No. In another statement, letter uh, 28, 1897, it's found in Selected Messages, volume 2, page 84. She writes, there will always be false and fanatical movements made by persons in the church huh, who claim to be led by God. Those who will run before they are sent and will give day and date for the occurrence of unfulfilled prophecy. Are you following me or not? The enemy is pleased to have them do this for their successive failures and leading into false lines cause what? Confusion and unbelief. So it creates a false excitement. But what happens after the excitement? The people are worse off than before. Let's not fall into that trap. Now let's talk about the oath in Daniel and Revelation. As you compare 
Daniel 12 verse 7 where there's an angel that proclaims an oath in the name of the eternal God. You'll find there that the angel raises both hands to heaven when he proclaims the oath. Whereas in Revelation chapter 10, the angel raises only one hand to heaven when he utters the oath in the name of the eternal God. So why does the angel in Revelation 10 raise only his right arm uh, in swearing the oath and not both arms? Because in Revelation 10, the angel already has what? He has the little book in his left hand. Are you with me? Details are important. Now, there's a difference between the oath in Daniel and the oath in Revelation. In Daniel, the oath is done in the name of the everlasting God. But the book of Revelation adds, in the name of the everlasting God, He who created the heavens and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the seas and the things that are in it. Where does that language come from? It comes from the fourth commandment of God's law. Which means that this movement is going to bring to light to the world what? Is going to bring to light to the world the Sabbath commandment. Do you think it's a coincidence that shortly after 1844 individuals within the Seventh-day Adventist Church there was actually no church but within the Advent movement discovered that the Sabbath is God's day of rest. It was already predicted here. When the angel made the oath, he attracts attention not only to the everlasting God, but also to the God who is the creator. And uh, it's a reference back to the fourth commandment, almost quoted verbatim, and it takes you all the way back to Genesis 2, where God instituted or establish the Sabbath. Now, we have to link Revelation 10 with the first angel's message. You remember I mentioned that Revelation 10 um, is a judgment hour message because it's a message that comes from the little book. Well, what does the first angel's message announce? The hour of his judgment has come. Is this message of the little book a global message? Yeah, foot on the sea and foot on the land. Is the first angel's message a global message? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and what? And people. Does uh, Revelation 10 attract attention to the Creator? Yes. Does the first angel's message attract attention to the Creator? Are you with me? So, the proclamation of the message of the little book in Revelation 10 is which message? The first angel's message. And of course you have to add there the second and the third because they all go together. Now, um, let's talk about the mystery of God. That's the next point in the vision. But let me emphasize once again that the mystery of God does not follow the oath chronologically. Chronologically, what comes after the oath is the eating of the little book. Sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach. In other words, Revelation 10 verse 7, the finishing of the mystery of God, takes us to a time after the eating of the book, and the book being sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach. You're going to see that. So basically, Revelation 10 verse 7, which speaks about the mystery of God, is a parenthetical statement. It's a statement, it's, it's, it's in other words, to clarify what is going to happen when the message from the little book comes to an end. Uh, in the book of Revelation this happens sometimes where you have a parenthetical statement. Uh, let me just give you an example. Can, some, uh, can I just borrow your Bible a minute? Go with me to Revelation 20. See, when we study the Bible we have to be careful because um, you know sometimes th the sequence is broke. And so we need to make sure that the sequence is the way that we perceive it to be as we study. Revelation 20. Let me ask you, who resurrects in the first resurrection? The righteous or the wicked? The righteous. The righteous. Well, let's read it. Revelation 20, verse 4. 
And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And this is the first resurrection. Um, because it says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the what? In the first resurrection, because the second death has no power over those who resurrect in the first resurrection. So the righteous resurrect in the first resurrection, but now we have a serious problem when we go to verse 5. It says in verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Are you perceiving the problem? It, it gives the, per, the perception that the first resurrection is after the millennium, which is the resurrection of the wicked. This problem is, is solved very simply by placing parentheses like the NIV does and other modern versions. You put parentheses uh, where at the beginning of verse 5, where the word but is, and you close the parentheses with the word finished. That is a parenthetical, it's an explanation of what happens with those who resurrect after the thousand years. It's an explanatory note. What is the purpose of parentheses? It's to add an explanation that breaks the flow of thought, right? And you say, but Pastor Bohr, you're adding parentheses to the Bible. There were no punctuation marks when the writers wrote the Bible. The punctuation marks have been placed where the translators feel that they should go. Are you with me? Like there's no chapters and verses in the original writings. So it's perfectly proper to put parentheses around this. Now, let's read verse 4 and skip what we put in parentheses and see if it makes sense. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Does that make sense? So, so Revelation 10 verse 7 breaks the flow of thought. It doesn't happen after the, right after the oath. It happens after John eats the book and it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. Following me? Okay. Let's talk about the mystery of God. It says in Revelation 10 verse 7, But in the days of the seventh, sounding of the seventh angel when he is about to sound, notice it's not when the seventh trumpet sounds. Would this be very close to the end of the sixth trumpet? That this is going to happen? Very close to the end? Yes, because it says, In the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is what? About to sound. This is very close to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. But it's not when the seventh trumpet sounds. What is going to happen when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, when Jesus is going to take over the kingdoms of the world? It says the mystery of God would be what? Would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So what's going to be finished when the seventh trumpet is, is about to sound? The mystery of God. So is it important to understand what the mystery of God is? What is the mystery of God? Fortunately, the Apostle Paul uses the word mystery very frequently in his writings. I have one example here in our syllabus. Romans 16, 25 to 27. In short, folks, the mystery of God is the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the, of the message of salvation. That's what the mystery of God is. So let me ask you, when would the mystery of God be finished? <clears throat> At the second coming or when probation closes? When probation closes. Because after probation closes, nobody can be saved. Are you with me or not? So, Paul say, writes, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, my what? Paul say, my gospel, and the what? And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the what? Mystery. Kept secret since the world began. What is the mystery that was kept secret since the world began? 
the plan of salvation. When was the plan of salvation laid? When Adam and Eve sinned, God says, "Uh uh-oh, what are we going to do now? Let's devise a plan, folks. No. Had a plan been devised in the ages of eternity past. But it was held in secret. I'm going to read a statement from Ellen White. So now to him was able to, uh, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began. <clears throat> but now made what? Manifest. And by what? Could I get some water? <clears throat> um, I got this bug from my son. <laughs> You know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. (laughs) Anyway, I'll get over it. Verse 26. But now made manifest. In other words, it's revealed. By the prophetic scriptures. Made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. For obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Thank you. Has a little lemon in it too. <clears throat> so what is the mystery? <clears throat> it is the gospel and the preaching of whom? The preaching of Jesus. Uh, now notice this statement from Ellen White. This is a beautiful statement. Signs of the Times, March 25, 1897. The incarnation of Christ is a what? A mystery. The union of divinity with humanity is a mystery. Indeed, hidden with whom? With God. Even the mystery, now she quotes Paul, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages, It was kept in eternal silence by Jehovah and was first revealed where? Where would that be? Where, where is that reference found in the Bible? <clears throat> Genesis 3.15 So it says, And was first revealed in Eden by the prophecy that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head and that he should bruise his heel. <clears throat> To present to the world this mystery that God kept in silence for eternal ages before the world was created, before man was created, was the part that Christ was to act in the work he entered upon when he came to this earth. And this wonderful mystery, the incarnation of Christ, and the atonement that he made must be what? Declared to every son and daughter of Adam whether Jew or Gentile. So the mystery of God is what? The preaching of the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of salvation. What would the finishing of the mystery of God mean? It must mean that there is no longer any use for preaching the gospel because the door of opportunity has what? It's closed. So what's going to happen shortly before Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world? Probation is going to close and the preaching of the gospel is going to come to an end. Now they're still going to, Babylonian preachers are still going to be preaching. But as far as preaching for salvation, there'll be no more preaching for salvation because the door of mercy has already what? Closed. Incidentally, you know the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a unique belief that no other church has. And that is that the door of probation will close before the second coming of Christ. And that after the, probation, the door of probation closes, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. What do the churches teach? They teach, well, the church is going to be raptured away before that. Yes. Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches no. The preaching of the gospel will come to an end. Probation will close. And then God's people will be here during the great time of trouble. But at the end of the time of trouble, Jesus will come to take over the kingdom. 
God's people will be delivered. Everyone who is found written where? Everyone who is found written in the book. So, let's go to the next paragraph. The mystery of God, the preaching of the gospel to the world, will come to an end shortly before the seventh trumpet begins to sound. At that time, Jesus will remove his high priestly robes and clothe himself with his kingly robe. This is the moment that is described in Daniel 12, verse 1, where the expression stand up means that the kingdom of Jesus is complete and now he is going to rule over his kingdom, which are his people. How was it determined who was a member of his kingdom? In the investigative, investigative aspect of the judgment. Now, the moment is also described in Revelation 15, 5 through, 18, uh, 5 through 8, when Christ's work of intercession comes to an end in the heavenly nows, that's the heavenly temple, the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So what is the sequence? There's a preaching of the message of the judgment. Probation closes. The mystery of God is finished. No more preaching of the gospel for salvation. The time of trouble. And then the seventh trumpet sounds. And Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world. Now Revelation 15, 5 through 8 describes the moment when probation closes. Remember now we're going forward. We still haven't dealt with the eating of the little book. The eating of the little book happens before this. Because this is a parenthetical statement. So maybe I should have left this in the syllabus even though I'm following the order that's found in Revelation 10. Maybe I should reverse it and leave this till the end. But anyway, I want you to have clear in mind that this is a parenthetical statement of things that happen after the eating of the little book. Now Revelation 15, 5 through 8 is very interesting. Let's read those verses. And I have some explanatory notes in brackets. After these things I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Stop there for a moment. What is the tabernacle of the testimony? What was the tabernacle? The tabernacle was the tent, right? The sanctuary tent. How many apartments did the sanctuary tent have? Two. The tent. I'm not talking about the court. The sanctuary tent. The tabernacle had two apartments. Did you notice here that this is the temple of the tabernacle? Did you catch that or not? It's not the tabernacle. What is opened? The temple of the tabernacle is opened in heaven. What is the temple of the tabernacle? The word temple is the Greek word naos. It's used 16 times in Revelation. Always refers to the most holy place. One example, Revelation 11, 19. It says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. So this is happening in the most holy place. So it says, The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. What is the temple opened for? Oh, so people can go in. By the way, can we enter the temple today? Can we enter the, the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? Yeah, we can, by faith. So you're saying, oh, this is saying that, that the most holy place is open in heaven so that people can come in faith to Jesus and be saved. No, no, no. Mm -mm. The temple is open for a different reason. Verse 6. And out of the temple. <laughs> temple isn't open for people to go in. The temple is open for the plague angels to come out. Does that mean that probation is closed when the plague angels come out? Yes. yes. So it says, And out of the temple came the seven angels, having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. Has probation closed when the cups are filled with the wrath of God? Yes. Absolutely. And it continues saying here, who lives forever and ever. The temple, what is the temple? The most holy place. The temple was filled with smoke 
from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to what? To enter the temple. Can we enter the temple today? Can we claim Jesus as our intercessor in the temple? We can enter today by faith, right? We can come boldly to the throne of grace, the Bible says. But this is speaking of a time when the temple is filled with smoke and no one will be able to what? To enter the most holy place by faith. Until when? Till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. And you say, well, will we be able to enter the temple after the seven plagues? Yes. The 144,000 says they serve in, in his temple day and night. We'll be able to enter literally there in the temple. Now notice Revelation 22. This is another passage that deals with, specifically with this issue of three stages. Close of probation, time of trouble, and second coming, and then the reward. It says there in Revelation 22, verse 10, And he said to me, this is at the end of the book of Revelation, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. What book is he referring to? The book of Revelation. Can, can a message of salvation come out of the book of Revelation today for the world? Absolutely. So when it says don't seal the words of the prophecy of this book, can people still read the book and understand it and be saved? Yes. yes. But then it says, for the time is at hand. Don't seal the book. A message can come forth from the book, but it says, the time is near. The time is about to come. Which time is about to come? The next verse tells us. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Does that sound pretty final? He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. What event is that? The close of human probation. Is that the second coming of Jesus? This is the same as when the mystery of God is finished. And then, notice, after, after this sentence is given, Jesus says, and behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Jesus cannot bring the, bring the reward without first have, have, have revealed what the reward is. And it's in the investigative judgment that the reward is revealed. Jesus simply brings his reward when he comes. Do you th see three stages here? The door is open. The book of Revelation is not sealed. It can present a message to the world. But the time is near when what? When every case is decided. And then Jesus says, I will come. Exactly what we saw in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. In fact, uh, time is just about up. But let's go to this next passage because I don't want to come back to this because it's the last little part. Um, this evening we're going to deal with a bittersweet experience. Now this will be revealed because we covered this when we talked about the little book. What are the three stages of the judgment? What is the first? Is the door open during the investigation? Is salvation open? Yes. What's the second? The verdict. What's the third? The execution or the implementation of the verdict based on the investigation. Do we find that in Revelation 10? Does a message come forth from the little book in Revelation 10? Can people be saved? Sure. But is the mystery of God going to be finished? Is the mystery of God going to be finished? Before the seventh trumpet sounds? Yes. What is that? The close of probation. And then what is Jesus going to do? He's going to come to take over the kingdoms. It's the same thing? Same thing. With different terminology. Now, let's go through this passage quickly. I've added explanations in brackets. Um, and the, when you add brackets, it means that it's not part of the text. I'm not embellishing the Bible. I'm just adding explanatory notes. Uh, this is what happened October 22, 1844. Right here, what we're going to read is October 22, 1844. This is what happened in heaven. Now listen. 
Daniel chapter 8 gives us the date. 2300 days the sanctuary will be cleansed. Daniel chapter 7 says, hey, I'm going to tell you what happened in heaven at that date. And Revelation 14 says, now you need to proclaim this to the world. I watched till thrones were play, put in place. And the Ancient of Days was seated. Were the thrones there before? By the way, who's sitting on the thrones? Thrones. Plural. The 24 elders. The representatives of the worlds that never sinned. They're, they're the heavenly jury. Because the angels are also watching. Every trial has a jury, has people who observe to make sure that the judge is doing things correctly. So it says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Where is this taking place? In heaven. heaven. The Ancient of Days lives in heaven. We pray, Our Father which art everywhere. No, we pray, Our Father which art what? In heaven. So this is happening in heaven. His garment was as white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Who are those? The angels. Where do the angels live? In heaven. And then it says, the court was seated. So was the court seated before this? Did the judgment take place before this? Is this happening after 1798? Yes, because it's after the 1260 years of the little horn. Daniel 7 doesn't give us the date, but it says after, after 1798. Daniel 8 will give us the date, the 2300 days. Verse 13. So the books are open. What are the books open for? The investigation. Whose cases are going to be investigated? The, those who claim Jesus, right? Why is there an urgency to do that before the second coming? Because when Jesus comes, he's going to take him with him. But before he can take him with him, he has to reveal who he has a right to take. Does he have to do that with the wicked? No, because the wicked are going to be left here. They can be dealt with later. Seventh-day Adventist theology makes all the sense in the world, folks. Simply, it's, it's simply the fact that we become evangelical in our thinking. We become superficial in our thinking. We don't dig deeply into scripture, into prophecy. And many times we simply repeat what we've heard over and over and over again. We don't go to the text and study it for ourselves. There's so much more to see in prophecy than what we're hearing in evangelistic meetings. Now, I know that evangelistic meetings are for non-Adventists. That's good. It's not a criticism of evangelism. But we have to go beyond there as Adventists. Notice verse 13. Father moves, sits, books are open. And then in verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus. Coming with the clouds of heaven. Who are they? The angels. He came to where? Is he coming to the earth? No. He's going to the ancient days in heaven. What apartment do you think the ancient of days went to? The temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen. Hello. What apartment is that? The most holy place of the sanctuary. So he comes to the ancient of days and it says, and they, that is the clouds, brought him near before him, that is before God the Father. Why does he go there? Then to him was given. To whom was given? Jesus. To Jesus. Who gave it to him? The Father. What is the Father going to give Jesus when Jesus goes beginning in 1844 to judges the cases, judge the cases of all those who claim the name of Jesus? It says then, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Are you following me? So Jesus goes to the Father to receive the kingdom. When will Jesus receive the kingdom? What is the kingdom? His people. The totality of his people are his kingdom. 
So when does Jesus receive the totality of his kingdom? Once every single case has been decided. His kingdom is complete. Are you following me? This is not rocket science. We just have to think. Not read. Think. And reason. There's very little reasoning in the world today. One thing that frustrates me beyond no end. Sometimes I go to preach in certain places. And you know Adventists who have been Adventists for 40 years. Things that we should that we should be well versed on, and, and and it's because we become we become junkies. I'm speaking too pl too plainly here. You know, we, we we want junk food, easy stuff, a smooth message. Now, oh, let's get back here. No more criticism. <laughs> notice verse 18 by the way where is the kingdom given to Jesus before we read verse 18 where is the kingdom given to Jesus it's given to him in heaven so when his kingdom is complete let me ask you this is the mystery of God finished when his kingdom is complete yeah the mystery of God is finished because nobody else is going to be saved the mystery of God is finished. Probation closes. The verdict in favor of God's people is given in heaven, not on earth. But is a time coming when the saints will actually possess the kingdom? Notice verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. When does that happen? When Jesus comes. And possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And then notice verse 21. Repetition. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. Came to where? To earth, right? No. What did we read previously? After the little horn, immediately after the little horn, it says the Ancient of Days comes. He sits on the throne. The books are open. So this is a repetition of that idea. Until the Ancient of Days came. Where did he come to? The most holy place. From where? From the holy place. You know, I never cease to be amused by Adventists who say, Jesus went directly into the most holy place. That is the most absurd thing that you could ever think. Because Jesus came to live his perfect life in the camp. That's a, that's a part of the sanctuary that we never, never think of. We always begin in the court. Sanctuary begins in the camp. Because before the lamb could be sacrificed, the lamb had to be without blemish. The, the lamb without blemish represents the perfect life of Christ in our midst. His sacrifice would have had no value if he had not lived a perfect life in our camp. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. So when he goes to the cross, he's a perfect lamb. Are you with me? So his life is lived in the camp. His death is in the court. And then suddenly, whoop, he jumps into the most holy place. So he had no holy place ministry. It's absurd. The holy place is the place where the priest intercedes. And you say, well, what happened in 1844? The fact is that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest continued interceding. He just added another function. Jesus, after he entered the most holy place, he continues to intercede. But now he's also performing a work of judgment. He's added a function. Let me ask you, is the death of Jesus based on his perfect life? Is his perfect life indispensable for his death? Yes. Is his death indispensable for his intercession? Yes. Is his intercession indispensable for the judgment? Yes. yes, because only those who have confessed their sins and repented and placed them in the sanctuary through Jesus will be found not wanting in the judgment. So, you know, people say the cross, the cross, only the cross. No, 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 it's a package deal. 
Without his perfect life, the cross has no value. The cross without his intercession, we're lost. And the judgment to determine who are his, based on whether they accepted the sacrifice of Christ and the life of Christ, is worthless as well. It's everything. And that's what makes the Seventh-day Adventist Church unique, is that we get the whole picture. We're not stuck only at the cross. We see the whole process of salvation from beginning to end, every aspect of the functions of Christ. Quickly, verse 21. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Remember that we already read this before? Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. What is the purpose of this judgment? It's to give a verdict in favor of the saints of the Most High. When is that verdict given? It's given on earth when Jesus comes, right? No. Because it continues saying, don't miss this point. A judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. How can it be clearer? Do you see the three points of the judgment? Investigation, verdict, both of those in heaven. Investigation, verdict in heaven, and then possessing the kingdom when Jesus comes. Last point, verse 25. And then we will go to eat the food that perishes. <laughs> Speaking about the little horn, he shall speak wo pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Is that a repetition of things that we've read before in the chapter? See, Daniel 7 runs in cycles. Each cycle explains some aspects of the previous part. Verse 26, but the court shall be seated, where? We've already read it, in heaven. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. Notice it says, they shall take away his dominion. The Father, the Son of Man, and those that sit on the thrones will take away his dominion. And then it continues saying, uh, but the court shall be seated, they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Is that when they're actually going to take over the kingdom? Yes. And then it speaks about Jesus. It says His kingdom, because ultimately it's His. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Are you following me? Are we doing all right? Is it becoming clearer as we go along? Yeah. See, as we start putting the pieces of... See, it's, 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 the study of Revelation 10 is like, like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, when you put the first two or three pieces, you're kind of lost. You say, what is this? But then as you add more pieces, you start catching the pictures. Oh, no, now I get it. So when we finish all of this, suddenly it's going to click. Say, now I got it. So, was this some invention that was made after the great disappointment? This is not some invention. This happened, and then afterwards, the remnant people, when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was formed, they said, wow, look at Revelation 10. That's exactly what happened to us. They saw it. So it's not that they're just projecting, they're trying to invent a scenario. No, they're seeing the fulfillment of their movement step by step within Revelation chapter 10. So, is it clear what we studied? Now, don't miss, don't miss tonight. Tonight will be great. It's the bittersweet experience and the measuring of the temple. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful things from your word. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you for the awesome privilege of belonging to your remnant people. But Father, we know that it's also an awesome responsibility when we have much light, much is demanded from us. So I ask, Lord, that you will help us to take these things 
into our minds, into our hearts, and to feel that passion that will lead us to share them with others who are in the world confused. They don't understand what's happening. Their hearts are failing them for fear because they don't know where things are leading. We have such a comforting message for them to know exactly where we are and where things are going. Help us, Lord, to proclaim this message with power because it's time for Jesus to close the door of probation, Jesus to come. He's been delayed too long. And so we end this prayer by saying, even so, come, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.